and let's take a look at how you could set up the focus. Now these cameras, the D7000 and the D5100, have autofocus, but it's really quite bad for shooting video. If you're a dedicated video shooter, you're probably not going to have autofocus working because you'll have some talent or your composition all set up and your focus will automatically grab onto something and just start wandering and really ruin your shot. What you want to do is use a manual focus. You can keep your camera set up to be autofocus, but you want to manually adjust that. So I'm just going to reach over to the camera here and adjust my focus. I'm just going to turn my focus ring. Now you might wonder which areas are in focus at any given time. So uh, what we can do is turn on video peaking. And what that does is highlights areas of the image that are in focus. So I'm going to click on focus and turn on peaking. Now when you do that it turns your image into grayscale and allows you to see which parts of the image are in focus. These areas outlined in green are considered to be in focus. And I'm just going to adjust the focus a bit more and we'll watch how the video peaking picks up on different areas that are in focus. So I'll focus closer, I'll move the focus further away, and I'm just going to turn the peaking off. Normally you could see just fine what's in focus, but a lot of times people will shoot videos with a separate video puller, and that's someone who's standing beside the camera and his only job is to move the focus while someone else is shooting the video. So what you can do is have the focus puller look at the screen and turn on the peaking. Then they can transition the focus from one point of interest to another very easily. Now sometimes it's not practical for the focus puller to be looking at the same screen depending on how you have your rig set up. So what you can do is just clone it and this brings up a separate image and now if you're on a laptop, you can take this and put it on a separate monitor. And the focus puller can look at this one instead. And to turn that off, you just click on clone here. So turn it on here and off there. Now depending on the composition and the, and the subject matter here, the peaking can have some problems. And it'll have problems if there's not a lot of contrast and light. So a really dark scene, not a lot of contrast, you might not see any peaking lines here. So what we can do is just ensure for focusing purposes that you have a lot of light and a lot of contrast. Sometimes you can have too much light and too much contrast and the peaking will overcompensate and show you things that are not quite in focus. So what you could do is tell it to be more strict and you just click on this button here and that will tell it to look just a little bit more closely about what is actually in focus. And so here you can see it's being quite strict and only showing these parts. So you really have to uh, experiment with this. It depends on the scene. Normally it doesn't have to be strict, but uh, sometimes you will need to enable it. I'm just going to turn off peaking. Now one other thing we could do here, even though I said you shouldn't use autofocus while you're recording, if you're just trying to set up the composition, you can use autofocus to bring in the focus close to where you need to be. So let's say I wanted to focus in um, on this area here on this flower. Now all I need to do is click on here to bring up my focus box and then you just left click anywhere on the image. That just moves the target box. You haven't told it to autofocus yet. This target box is used by autofocusing, and if I click on autofocus, it's going to attempt to focus on something within that box. So let's give it a try. And the box turned green, which means that the camera figured it found something in focus. Now you can also zoom in on this area under the box. So if I just click on zoom, it takes us a lot closer. And then you could just fine tune the focus if you like. Now I'm just gonna move the focus here a little bit. And I think it got it pretty close. So you turn off zoom and it brings you back. 
So this target box here is used both for focusing and zooming. So let's say, even though I know this area up here is out of focus and I don't want to focus on it, but I want to zoom in on it, all you have to do is put the box on it and hit zoom. And then when you don't need the focus box anymore, you can just turn it off. And peaking, you can also change the colors. So if I go here, don't like green, but I want to peak in yellow, you could do that. Or maybe in red, is whatever you prefer. So I'll turn off peaking. Now in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see some indicators. And let's start off with this one here. If I'm recording, this shows the elapsed time of the recording. So currently three, four seconds of uh, video has been recorded. And so when you stop recording, that turns it off. This also shows the current aspect ratio. And I'm just going to try changing that aspect ratio. Let's go directly into CinemaScope 2.39 to 1. Makes it look like a anamorphic wide screen here. This aspect ratio now shows here at 2.39 to 1. This 23 here is the frames per second that this imagery is being displayed in live view. This is not the frames per second that your video will record. So I have a fairly fast computer here and it is currently displaying images here in live view at 23 frames per second. And if I were to start recording, it's still putting images here in live view at 23 frames per second. However, it is recording the video at 24 frames per second because that's the video standard, the video format I've selected on the camera LCD menu. On slower computers, you'll see this frame rate slow down and on my tablet PC, this will drop down to 11, 12 frames per second depending what I'm doing. But it's always still recording at 24 frames per second on the camera. This status indicator here shows what the battery level is and I have a freshly charged battery so that is 100% remaining. And this one here shows how much time is left for the thermal countdown. Nikon will only allow you to have live view running for a certain amount of time before you have to shut down live view and bring it back up. And the concern there is overheating of the sensor. And the overheating can occur if you have the LCD monitor on the back of your camera active. But when we're tethered and in live view, it is not active on the back of the camera, so the heating is a lot less. They don't want the sensor to overheat because it'll degrade the image quality. It'll become noisier. So what will happen here is if you leave this run long enough and it says there's 28 minutes remaining until the sensor will reset, when you hit the, the end of that 28 minutes, the live view will shut down and that's it. You'll still remain connected to your camera. If you find that you're getting close to the bottom of the limit, at any time you could just turn off live view and bring it back up and it resets the counter. So let's talk a little bit more about those aspect ratios. If I go back into my settings, D7000 and D5100 will record in these two formats, 4 to 3 or 16 to 9. But you may, as a cinematographer, want to have your video at a different aspect ratio. So if I wanted to have my end video result to be a 1.85 to 1, I just select that, go back into live view, So now I'm looking at the aspect ratio of 1.85 to 1. And if I start recording, it's still going to record at 16 to 9, which is what I set on the back of my camera. However, it's just going to crop it within Cinematographer Pro so I can visualize what this is going to look like if I crop it to 1.85 to 1 in post-processing. And the same goes for the other one here, 2.39 to 1. If I start live view up again, and I start recording, it's still going to record in 16 to 9, because that's what I said at the back of my camera, although it's going to display here at 2.39 to 1. Now the cropping is done from the horizontal center line of the image, so basically crops evenly the top and bottom. So the aspect ratios help you visualize what your final video is going to look like from post-processing. Let's talk a little bit about the resolution of the image that is displayed here in live view. You may have noticed it looks a little bit grainy. You could see a little bit of jitter here. 
And if you look closely here, it looks like JPEG artifacts. And indeed, that is what it is. Because your camera is sending you a stream of images that are 640 by 426 in resolution at a normal JPEG compression. And that's not very good quality. And you'll really notice this if you expand this. And you can go full screen on Cinematographer Pro but it's just gonna wind up being quite pixelated. This will only look good if you're sitting back a little ways from your monitor or you're on a much smaller monitor. So let's take a look at the reason why it looks so grainy on your computer monitor. Well, in live view on these Nikon cameras, and for example, on the D7000, it's capturing live view data at 24 frames per second at a resolution of 4928 by 3264. This is the highest resolution in the camera. Unfortunately, that's just too big to send to your computer down a USB 2.0 cable at 24 frames a second. So the camera will compress it and shrink this image to a 640 by 480 or 640 by 426 JPEG normal at 24 frames per second. Then it'll send it to your computer and then we display it in live view. So it starts off at this very large image and winds up down at this smaller low quality image. If you are looking at this image and wondering, is this what my end video is going to look like? The answer is no. Your end video is still being recorded at 19 by 20 by 1080 or whatever you have set up your camera for. And there's really not too much you could do about the quality here. If you go back into settings, you can control whether it's higher or lower quality. If you have a slower computer, you set it to lower, but it's going to make the quality even a little worse. And that's it. That's how you use Cinematographer Pro to capture video using your Nikon DSLR. Happy tethering.